But what I am going to start with is why do we want birds? Um, you know, a, a lot of people, uh, they come in uh, and they've seen their neighbor or a family member uh, or somebody birding, uh, and it's something they want to do, but they're, they're unsure as to why they should do it, which is a perfectly reasonable question. Um, getting into any new hobby or activity, finding out why you should do it is just as important as, you know, getting the right things to do it. So what do birds bring to the garden? Well, a lot of the smaller seed eating birds, sparrows and finches, for example, will actually eat weed seeds. So right away, bringing them in will help you keep down uh, a lot of the, the, those, those weeds that we have that spread by seeds, even up to including dandelion. That's very nutritional for them. That's why you always see those birds go to seed feeders. And we're gonna talk more about specific foods. Uh, Birds help with uh, with bugs. Uh, you see birds, and they've got a, a caterpillar in their mouth. Uh, some of the smaller birds will hop around. They'll help with aphids. They'll help with other problem bugs. Now, they may also pick off beneficial bugs. They aren't picky. But again, beneficial bugs tend to be quicker. Uh, the problem bugs tend to be slower. So that's the ones they're going to go for. So they'll help pick off that bird song. Come on. It's relaxing, it's beautiful. Um, everybody I know, uh, nobody hates it. Some people are indifferent, but that sound of the birds returning in the spring, when you wake up on those mornings and you can hear all the birds singing to each other, or you walk through Fish Creek Park or Nose Hill Park, uh, and the birds are, are singing everywhere, it's, it's just wonderful. If you bring in uh, certain birds, it'll help attract other birds. So if you have, say, sparrows uh, and finches and chickadees see them, they'll be like, hey, we kind of eat the same thing. We're kind of the same size. We should go check that location out. If it's good for them, it might be good for us. Uh, so animals are attracted to what other animals are doing. They can help keep away problem birds. Um, if you've got a small amount of birds, uh, a magpie, it's not going to care. Uh, it's going to come in and the birds are going to scatter. But if you have a yard filled with uh, small songbirds, quite often the problem birds that are very opportunistic will go elsewhere. And if you think about it, if you've ever been walking through, uh, Carburn Park is a great example. One of my favorite parks here in Calgary, uh, for anybody tuning in, not in Calgary. Um, Carburn is just full of life. It has everything. It's got ducks and beaver and geese and owls and deer, uh, coyote, um, but it's also got woodpeckers, chickadees, magpies. Um, and if you're in an area uh, at the back of Carburn with all the shrubs and, and small trees and whatnot, it is littered with a uh, finch and chickadee, but you rarely see a magpie. Now you go out into the area where there's much bigger trees and it's much more open. Uh, it's full of magpies uh, and crows, but not as many chickadees. Um, and the reason for that is the correct environment for them. But the magpies, they don't want to compete with a thousand other little birds. They'd sooner compete with 10, 20 of their own species. So it can help with that. They can also indicate environmental issues. Birds are a great barometer uh, for what's going on. So if you see a ton of birds and they're attracted to something, you might go, oh, what is over there? It might be beneficial, it might, it might be detrimental, but either way, the birds are going to give you an indication of what's happening. Uh, they act as a natural fertilizer. Uh, so you have all these songbirds flying around and coming to your feeder. You have a feeder this big filled with food and they eat it all. Uh, well, that has to go somewhere. I think we all know how that works. Um, and uh, bird poop is actually laden with NPK, the three primary macronutrients that all plants need. So it is now, and again, in larger concentrations, like any fertilizer, it can be harmful. But if they're flitting about all over your garden, uh, a lot of times it will be beneficial. And then 
you know, one of the last, but, but certainly not least reasons is bird watching. It's a fun activity. The amount of people I see uh, that will post pictures, new bird at the bird feeder, uh, the kids get into it. Uh, people even name their birds. I'm, I'm specifically talking about my sister. Uh, but people will uh, be like, oh, there's Greg, the robin. Uh, and they get used to them. And the reason for that is they start recognizing them like, Greg might be a little shorter and uh, chubbier than say Melody, who's long and lean and she's coming to the feeder too. And they start recognizing their birds and they start caring for them. And birds are highly intelligent. Uh, you put out food for them, they'll get used to you. They'll, they'll hang out on the fence or on the hedge, watch you fill the feeder, you hang the feeder and turn around and whoosh, they're all in there. So those are some of the reasons why we want birds. And then I compile the list and in no way is this complete. Uh, but these are some of the more common birds uh, that we'll see. Um, and I know personally, so I've never had a jay in my yard. My sister has, my sister has blue jays. Uh, I believe she's named them. Um, but I've never had a jay in my yard. Uh, sad. Is that an upside down heart? Um, but this morning I went out, uh, as I said, I watered my garden this morning and I went out and there was a flicker uh, in my front yard. I see them all the time. I don't name them. Uh, and it was running across the lawn and pecking at things. And I turned the water on. I had the hose. He got scared. He took off. No problem. So I water all my plants. I go to the backyard. He was in the backyard. I'm like, oh, hey, buddy, I got to disturb you again. Um, but I've seen flickers. Uh, I've seen woodpeckers. Um, any number of small chickadees, magpies and crows, they come. Um, I've got a pretty diverse yard. Now I'm right next to Confederation Park. So a lot of birds do hop over to see what's going on. Um, but those, those are a lot of the birds you can see and look to attract. So we want to attract birds. And a lot of times uh, when I say attracting birds, you may already have that type of bird in your garden. Maybe you've already got uh, a handful of black capped chickadees. Uh, and maybe they're there because you only have one of the three. You, shelter right a relatively easy one uh, a lot of people um have hedges cotone aster is a great hedge for it uh people will have shrubs uh small trees large trees um and the birds might just be there that might be their shelter their base they they tuck in there they hide there uh and then during the day off they go to find food and you're like well i want them to stick around i want more of these i love them and Black cap chickadees, put some seed in your hand, put your hand out, they'll come visit you, they're wonderful. Um, or maybe you see them flying around in your neighbor's yard, or maybe you've seen them pass by, uh, and you're like, well, how do I get these birds in? Well, every animal uh, requires three essentials, and there are other things you can do uh, to make your yard more welcoming, but the three basics for any animal are food, water, and shelter. And you have to offer uh, the right thing for the right bird. So uh, there's no point putting up, I'm gonna knock everything over. If things fall, they fall. We just keep, we steam right ahead. Okay, one take, uh, we don't mess around. But if you put up this and fill it with peanuts, okay? And I believe the picture, yup, is a blue jay. So the COVID-A family, uh, which are blue jays, gray jays, magpies, ravens, etc. They love peanuts. You put this up and you hang it in your garden and you're like, why am I not getting hummingbirds? You're not offering the right food. You will get birds, but you won't get the one you're attracting. So if you want a hummingbird, you're probably going to have to do a hummingbird feeder and hummingbird food. Um, now, if you want both, you put both, but don't put them close together because the hummingbirds might not like the size of the jays. So you want to separate them. You want to give them their own space so that they feel secure. And then shelter. A lot of times, uh, especially in new developments, people are like, I don't get any birds. I'm like, well, there's nothing there for them. You don't have a shrub for them to hide in. You don't have a tree for them to roost in. Uh, or build a nest in or get away from it. You got really nothing to put a birdhouse on. 
So there's nothing to, to give them that sense of security. At the end of the day, we all want shelter. We all want a home, an apartment. We want somewhere we can go to. When we're on vacation, we want a hotel. We like having that base that is ours. We feel safe there. Birds are no different. They like that. And it's the same thing. You put up a birdhouse like this with a tiny opening like that. Oh, that's fantastic for finches and whatnot. But maybe a robin can't get in there. Okay, and I say maybe, like, oh, maybe it can't get in there. Um, so you're going to need a birdhouse with a bigger opening. You put a bigger opening, the small bird won't get in there because it's not going to feel as secure. Uh, a predator can easier get in, where a robin is bigger, it can fight off the predator that can get in. So you need the correct design, uh, again, to attract the bird. Now, the one equalizer on all of them is water. Um, all birds, all animals, everything that lives requires water. You know, uh, every plant. Cactus require less. Uh, some birds can go uh, longer without water, vultures. Uh, but every bird requires water. Um, and how you give it to them is entirely up to you. But a clean drinking sauce um, is essential. So you can have, you know, fountains, bird baths, puddles, whatever, but they do need that. You provide those three things in the correct format, you're going to be able to attract the correct birds to your yard. And if you fill your yard with small bird houses and seed feeders like this, uh, small bird baths, uh, whatnot, you're gonna get smaller birds. The bigger birds are gonna be like, oh, this isn't suitable for me. I'm gonna look elsewhere and see if I can find somewhere uh, more suitable for what I need. So. When we talk about food, uh, again, there's a number of different types and I can't go into all of them and I can't go into what all of them attract. Uh, we just don't have the time. I could do an entire seminar just on all the different foods, but we'll quickly go through uh, the ones you see. And, you know, I think the most popular one when people think of foods, and I thought I grabbed a bag of it, here we go. I'll grab the jug actually, is seed, mixed seed, okay? And right there, uh, that is tiny, as you can see, lots of little ones. It fits great in these tube feeders. They fill it up and it has to be uh, the most popular. When people think of feeding birds, they think bird seed. Uh, and, and we know that just from the amount of people that ask about it, the amount of seed we have, we've got huge bags, 20 kilogram bags, all the way down to a little two kilogram bags. And, and sunflower seeds, niger seeds, mixed seeds, millet seeds. Um, and, and, and seeds are what, you know, the smaller songbirds really like. And then we've got uh, the nuts. And I think I've grabbed one here. Here we go, I'll grab this one. I didn't even have enough room for all the stuff I bought. But we got ones called Nutty Buffet, another one called Trina. By the way, all of our bird uh, food uh, comes from Canada, uh, and the other ones actually come from Alberta. Uh, very happy about that. Love supporting local as much as we can and supporting Canadian. Um, and these bigger plums, smaller songbirds will come and they'll peck at them and they'll break little chips off. But it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort for not a lot of food. They want to just reach in with their beak and get what they want. They don't want to spend the amount of effort. They need to conserve energy escape predators, find water, lay eggs, take care of their babies. They don't have a ton of excess energy to waste. So you take uh, larger nuts like that, and that's for your COVID day, uh, that's for your squirrels. Some people do like to feed them and whatnot. And then next is your hummingbird nectars. It's really, it's only for the hummingbirds. Um, and hummingbirds are, they're incredible. They move ridiculously fast. Uh, they're the only bird that like, can literally like up, down, backwards, stay in place. Uh, other birds obviously can stay in place, birds of prey and whatnot, but they'll, they'll, they'll be feeding while they're flying. And I put a fun fact just because a lot of people don't get it, but a hummingbird, and I have to keep reading it because it sounds really good. They can flap their wings 70 times in a second. So what, seven? Like, I, Unbelievable. And their heartbeat is 1,260 beats per minute. I mean, 
Blah. But anyway, <laughs> no wonder they need so much sugar uh, to keep going. It, it almost sounds like a teenager. Teenagers, I have one, are either 100% at rest or 100% at go with not much in between. Not much in between at all. So, uh, and then there's bugs. And bugs are an important food source. And if you see here, there's bugs mixed in there. And a lot of different birds like those, uh, we even have just straight bugs. We even have a bug suet. Uh, your woodpeckers love those. Uh, a lot of the songbirds, uh, some of the bigger birds uh, will eat them. Uh, very high protein, very, very good for them. And then suet. And suet is great. Uh, you can put it in a suet cage. Uh, some people will just put it out basically on a feeder like that. Let the birds eat it. Uh, and that's really good during the colder months. There's a lot of fat in it, a lot of protein. The birds need that because it is cold and food is scarce. So they really need to capitalize on it. Uh, you know, we want them all healthy and fat, sassy. So in the spring, we get more birds. So those are kind of all the different foods uh, you want. And then shelter. And if you remember, I'll go back to what I was saying about Carburn Park. Uh, and there's one end of Carburn Park, huge trees. Uh, and that area is filled with magpies. I, I have seen gray jays, I have seen blue jays, uh, but primarily magpies uh, and crows and ravens. And it is filled with them. Uh, and it's great. Uh, they're big, they can go up high, they can build their nests high, they're sturdier. Um, so it's a much better environment for them. It's right on the lake, so they can swoop down, they can bathe, they can feed, uh, uh, get water, sorry, I should say. So they have everything they need there. Um, and and there, is a, there is a benefit to the tree. Uh, a lot of times birds will be in a tree and they're like, oh, bugs, they've got food right there. They can also pollinate, they're flying, and they fly into an apple tree. Bam, they go right past all the flowers. They've got pollen all over their feathers and their feathers have a natural oil on them. And then they're like, ah, oh, let's see what the neighbors are doing. Bam, into that apple tree spreading the pollen or they're bouncing around the same tree. So birds are a pollinator. Now they're not specifically designed like a bee or a butterfly, but they do indeed pollinate. And then a birdhouse. And like I touched on, the houses are uh, you know, really important to get the specific one. I, I see people um, with the best intentions uh, put up a house for birds and then they're like, well, the birds won't go into my house. Uh, and there can be any number of reasons. Maybe the opening is too big or too small. Uh, maybe it's too hot in there. Uh, some people, again, with the best intentions, make these incredibly, incredibly structurally sound birdhouse. Thick wood, hard, all constructed together, screwed down, really tight, bolted on. It gets way too hot. The birds are like, I can't breathe in here, it's stifling. If you think about it, what a bird builds is a nest and they build their nest in sheltered area, but they need the airflow much like us. Think about stifling it. Come to the greenhouse when it's 34 degrees outside and you'll understand stifling. Everybody is taking uh, regular breaks, which obviously we uh, insist upon, encourage, uh, to get fresh air to cool down. Birds are the same. Um, and I believe this birdhouse here, you can even see there's ventilation. So the roof goes over the ventilation to keep rainwater out, but it allows airflow. It allows that gas exchange. Very, very important. Um, you want to make sure that they're non-toxic. Uh, don't cover them with a, a creosote or a varnish or something like that. You want to paint them, paint them, have fun. The birds like it, it attracts the eyes. Stay away from alarmingly bright colors uh, and stay away from any kind of heavy toxic paint, just a fun watercolor. You know, have fun, be creative, uh, but kind of do that. And that's what they're looking for. And then water. Like I said, every animal needs water. Uh, and I think, you know, when we think of birds and we think of water, first thing we think of is the bird bath. Bird baths are great because they are specifically designed for birds. Uh, unless it's a water bird, which we're not talking about here, you don't see a chickadee fly out to the middle of a lake and take a bath in the middle. 
And that's because if it's in that water, it can't swim and it can't get back out of it. So bird baths are great because they're sloped in. I don't know what's gonna fall here. There we go. But you can see the bird bath has a natural slope. So the bird can hop down. You like my bird impression? <laughs> we do charades here. The birds can hop down to the depth they're comfortable with. So a smaller bird might be on the edge and it might hop in, give a bath, take a drink and hop out. Bigger birds, bam, right in the middle. Okay, like robins, they love it. They go right in the middle and they're like, yeah, look at me. And they're having a blast. I, like literally the robin in the picture there. Um, and the important thing I want to bring up about water too, it's not just for drinking. You see birds after it's been scorching hot. Uh, here in Calgary, uh, our summers get very dry and very hot. And there can be times when we don't get rain for a long time. Then you get rain, you see puddles and the birds are flocked in them and they're washing themselves. And the reason for that is they need to preen. They need to get the dust off them. They need the oils to coat their feathers to keep them weather resistant. They need their feathers to be spaced out, not gunked up by dusty oil so that they can fly properly. So water is very essential for them. So a bird bath is great. It provides drinking water and it provides bathing water. Fountains, incredible. Reason I love fountains, is the sound of running water will actually attract them. That's what they're looking for. They're like, oh, I hear. There's a reason why if you go to small, gentle waterfalls, you see a ton of birds there. The, the, the sound has literally attracted them there. So uh, you have a fountain and, it, and it's making that sound. Uh, they'll come in. Now, if it's a big fountain and the water is pouring over the edge, some of the small birds, that's not suitable for them. It'll hurt them. It'll kill them. Ah, uh, so they'll stay away from that. But you can have those smaller fountains or a low flow fountain uh, that has a much shallower basin. They'll be very happy with that. So fountains work really well. Push comes to shove. Uh, you don't have um, uh, a bird bath. Uh, you don't have a fountain. Might not be in the budget for one. A large bowl. Now you put out a bowl and a bowl tends to not slope down. They tend to be like, steep edges, rounded bottoms. So with that, you can put some rocks in the middle, uh, anything you want, something to give the birds some height, like I said, so they can hop around uh, and get to what they need. You know, I see people and they put out a basin of water, a, a Tupperware, square edges, bam, and they're like, there's the water and the birds are like, that's no good to me. I, I can't get it. They perch on the edge and they can't reach in to get a drink properly. So you really want to, if you're going to put it out for the birds, you want to make sure that you have it set up for them. So different levels of stones or rocks or even a brick, something that they can hop on, where they can get some water and they can bath themselves. Puddles. And I said nature provides them. But I know in my garden, um, on one of my pathways, just over the years, as it happens, there's a spot that's slightly more sunken. After it rains or after I water, that gets watery. Fill that up. Fill that up. You're out watering your garden. It's hot and dry. You're probably watering your garden every day. Fill up the puddle. The birds will notice. The sound of the hose is running water. They're going to be like, oh, what's going on over there? I hear water. You fill up that puddle. You turn your back and they're like, yeah. And that's just like kids, right? Straight in there. I mean, a mess. And then sprinklers. I hope you guys have ever seen it, but it's awesome. You put a sprinkler out. Robins, again, especially. Not, yeah. <laughs> Robins have incredible hearing. I should have put that down as a fun fact. Uh, they've got one of the best hearing. Have you ever seen a robin when you're gardening, follow behind you and it runs across and it's cocking its head? It's listening for worms and grubs moving beneath the soil. That's why often if you watch robins, uh, clearly I spend way too much time in gardens. But you'll see them and they stop and they listen and then they're in with their beak. Rarely do they come up empty handed. They know exactly where it is. So they hear that sprinkler going and they're running through it. Now, you've got to be careful because a sprinkler like this, great for watering your garden. It's too hard for the birds. The birds won't go in that. Again, it's going to hurt them. They're small, they're light. That water spray is too much. 
You want to get an oscillating one, the ones that I go make the waves. I know, right? I'm awesome at charades. <laughs> or a spot sprinkler. And this is almost like a fountain head. So a gentle water flow is what they're looking for. But they love sprinklers. Uh, you put one out. Uh, if you've got birds in the area, they will come to your sprinkler. So that's how to attract birds. Now, you're bringing a wild animal into your garden, uh, which is good. All of the reasons why I've listed is good. Uh, there is nowhere, even the city of Calgary, you'll see signs, do not feed the bear, do not feed the deer, uh, do not feed the wild animals. But in your garden, nowhere tells you not to feed the birds. They say, do feed the birds, but follow these steps. So it's the same thing. Um, you, want to, you want to feed them. You want to make sure it's good. But you also want to make sure that your hobby is fun. There's nothing worse than doing something uh, and either failing um, or it just becoming uh, a disaster. So some of the main problems I listed here, squirrels, we've already touched on that. Wasps, corvidae, the jays, crows, ravens, whatnot, ants, and mold. And then, and I forgot to, I forgot to put this on there. My apology. But you also have an inherent problem of the birds themselves. You have a, a garden and uh, you've got bushes that are growing blueberries. You bring the birds in, the birds are like, oh my God, thanks for the seed. I could really use some blueberries to wash that down. And you're like, I didn't want you to eat that. Again, like having a teenager, you're like, look at all of this food, and then they eat what they're not meant to. Ah, uh, birds are inherently teenagers. Yeah, they are. <laughs> the, the, the bad problems they bring with them are inherently their teenage friends. Main takeaway. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. But squirrels is the number one uh, problem. We get people come to us and they're like, uh, I started feeding the birds, everything was going great, and the squirrels moved in. Uh, and yeah, squirrels can be a disaster around bird feeders. The destructive, they're tenacious. Uh, we have a fun video after this, uh, uh, we'll play it. But years ago, uh, there was a competition to develop a squirrel proof bird feeder. So somebody put a, a tablet out, about this big square wood, little ledge on it. They put seed on it and it was on one hinge in the middle on a pole. If anything heavier than, than say, you know, I, I can't remember what it was, but 12 grams landed on it, it tipped. So chickadees could land on it. They, you know, five, six, seven, eight, it starts getting too heavy and tipping. They fly up, it balanced itself. So a squirrel saw this and went, hey, perfect. Jumped on it, it tipped, bam, he's on the ground. Did it again, same thing. Did it again, by different sides, kept doing it. Eventually he came back with a friend they jumped together on either side and balanced it perfectly and ate all the seeds. So they are tenacious. They are cunning. They'll actively scare away the birds. They don't care. Uh, I've seen a squirrel take on a cat and come out the winner. So they really, really don't care. And they're wasteful. They will rip it open, take two or three things and just leave the rest on the ground. Uh, that becomes, you know, no, nothing's going to eat it except more squirrels, skunks. They attract other things to come in. So the best way to get rid of a squirrel is again, don't feed them the food they want. Don't put out nuts or use bafflers like this. And I think, is that the slide with the video, Brandy? I'm gonna let Brandy play the video. It's only about 30 seconds long, but it's too cute. <laughs> So that's the level of tenacity and intelligence to get seeds, to get nuts that you're dealing with. Uh, so, you know, I see people and they, they put out something like this and they put a little cover on it. Squirrels will figure that out. They'll figure out how to put it up and they'll jump, they'll leap, they'll fall and grab on. Like they are incredibly, incredibly strong. So if squirrel, why am I standing that up? If squirrels, uh, all the problem, I really recommend something like this. And the reason for that is this metal cage is built into the bird feeder. They can't chew through metal. They're not getting through this. And the holes aren't big enough for them to get in. So 
for songbirds can have their fun with it or if you want you can put suet in this one and the squirrels just cannot get in it also helps baffle the bigger birds as well so these are a great deterrent for the squirrels everything else they're probably going to figure out a way then the next one is wasps and we all know from uh, having a picnic or leaving a, uh, a, a glass of coke or a can of coke or something outside wasps do love sugar and you put out a bird feeder like this for your hummingbirds you want to catch them on their migration you're excited and suddenly it's covered in wasps hummingbirds aren't going to come near that now wasps they're not bad for the garden we've already talked about that they'll actually be pretty good they are a pollinator uh, they're predatory so they will go for other insects uh, a lot of uh, other uh, animals will be like oh nope wasps and they'll go away so wasps aren't inherently bad for the garden they're not great for us especially not kids uh you have a dog like mine that seems to like jalapeno flies uh and ends up with swollen faces uh and wasps will actively swamp uh they can be a real real pest now a lot of times one wasp stings a bird bird doesn't even feel it it doesn't get through the feathers uh the bird is fine but it can get through the feathers and when it stings them it hurts them like it hurts us now that bird is trying to get food the wasps aggressively attack it because they will swarm they can actually kill them so uh if a hummingbird tiny tiny little hummingbird is flying up and there's you know 20 30 wasps on it it's going elsewhere it, too much risk not enough reward but fortunately you can hang things and this is one of my favorites i don't even know where i put it here we go a waspinator is really great so wasps are fiercely territorial you put this out and this is even great if you're not feeding the birds uh put it on your deck bring it with you when you're having a picnic and it looks like a wasp's nest wasps are fiercely fiercely territorial so they see that and they go oh no there's another bigger wasp's nest here and they leave or you can literally just put a wasp trap out and get them to go in that and we've got you know traditional made for it and we've got you know nicer prettier more aesthetic ones we're bringing birds into the garden maybe we care about aesthetics this just has a stopper move that put in whatever you want sugar uh meat they like that uh we found a good blend was uh chopped up little bits of hot dog in coca-cola but yeah the wasps <laughs> they dig it so that helps you keep the wasps away so again the hummingbird isn't going to notice that it's not going to care if they're this far apart all the wasps are there they're not there the hummingbird is like great i'm going for my food the wasps are again going to go to the easiest source of food which are these two not realizing it's a trap because they're dumb so and then the corvidae uh a lot of people have these in their garden and they don't want them in the garden they're incredibly intelligent uh which is a good thing and a bad thing i mean the respect i have uh for these animals is phenomenal but the problem is is they can figure out how to get through most things uh they're opportunistic they will take an opportunity at anything they can figure out puzzles uh they can figure out an easy way to do things they're extremely destructive uh they'll tear things apart to get what they want uh with with little to no regard they're wasteful much like the squirrels uh they'll tear apart everything to get the thing that they want and then leave the rest uh exposed to the elements you know we have a bag of uh, bird feed out and we've seen that here in our own bird section a magpie gets in and it'll rip open four bags cherry picking the things it wants because it's intelligent enough to see that's the one i want and it goes, that's what i want and it literally cherry picks whatever it wants they are a, a, like the, the noise of them i talked about songbirds uh how pleasant it is waking up to tweet, 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 as opposed to ah, there is a big difference so they all loud and they will also attack and scare off songbirds you have a feeder out if they are hungry 
uh, they haven't found anything suitable for them and they think they can have a go at that feeder and there's only three or four sparrows a finch on it, that isn't going to phase them at all. They're coming in, they're going to hit it hard. They don't care what happens to the other birds. So what do we do with that? Well, again, like the wasps, they can be beneficial to a garden. They peck off uh, grubs. Uh, they'll actually dig into the lawn uh, to find chinch bugs, dew worms, things like that. They're, they're extremely confident at doing that. But you can also put up a separate feeder for them. So you can take this and hang it down at the bottom of your garden, or if you don't like your neighbors, hang it in your neighbor's garden. Oh, the spring opened. That's how you fill it. Um, and you can literally, so you may as well show that, actually. I didn't know that. To, oh, yeah, to fill it. It just locks on like that. Of course, now it doesn't want to open. Open it, take it like that, fill it with peanuts, open it up, pour in more peanuts, open it up, pour in more, all the way around until, and it's a spring, so it's not easy. If you've got two pairs of hands, so much the better. I've only filled these twice, I think, uh, and I did it once with somebody else, so much easier. It's not necessarily easier, you can fill it with more peanuts as all. Well. Hang this at the bottom of your garden. Again, if they have food here and that, 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 that seed hanger, the tube feeder uh, is a pain in the butt and this isn't, they're gonna come to this. They don't have the energy to waste. They don't wanna go there and scare away the other birds. They're doing it because again, they're opportunistic, they're intelligent. And then you don't wanna do that. You don't want them in your garden at all. You want them gone, stay away from the stuff they like. So. Don't hang things like this that are filled with nuts and bugs. Stick with your pure seeds. Stick with your sunflower seeds, your niger seed, your finch seed, and only put out the food for them. Like I said at the beginning, they will leave, they will go elsewhere. Ants. Again, ants are primarily a problem uh, for hummingbird feeders, but they will check out other feeders uh, simply because they're going to check it out and see if there's a viable food source for them. And if there is, they're going to take it. Uh, ants have that tenacity. They're not going to hurt a bird uh, like a wasp, but if you have a hummingbird feeder like that one there, and, and this part is just covered in ants getting out the sugar, the hummingbird isn't going to go to that. I, if I pick up a glass of Coke and it's covered in ants, I'm not drinking it. Uh, much the same for that. Uh, they will attract other pests. So other things will be like, oh, that's obviously a source of sugar. I'm going to go check it out. Much like the songbirds will attract other songbirds, that pests will attract other pests. It makes sense. They can bring mold spores. So ants will track all over your garden. Uh, in doing so, they'll find uh, powdery mildew, uh, rust, black spot. They'll carry that into seed feeders, into hummingbird feeders. Now you've got a fungal problem, a mold problem. It's unsightly. Having a feeder covered in ants, that's not what you hung it for. So you don't want that. So one of the funnest things that we saw is an ant moat. So you hang this part where you want your feeder, and then you hang your feeder. I should have just taken this out of the package. I wasn't prepared. Like that. Now the ants come down, do, 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 they get here. This is filled with um, oil or uh, water, whatever. And suddenly they're like, oh, I can't cross that. How do I get over that? And quite simply, they can't. Now you may end up, probably will end up with dead ants in that because they're going to try, but they're not, they're smart enough for want of a better word, seeing smart with insects, I know it, it doesn't really equate. They're smart enough to know that if 15 of their friends died and made no headway, they're going to go find an easy. They're not just gonna keep throwing bodies at something to die. They need those bodies to keep bringing in viable food for the rest of the colony. So they're not gonna do that. And then of course, you can always use ant traps and ant out around the nest, if, if they're coming down a branch and getting into your feeder, nestle one of these, a viable food source before they get to that, and that can work. Not always gonna be the greatest, 
can be difficult to put it up there, but it is another option, probably the, the least best option. And then there's mold. Uh, and like I said, I'm springing, but that's a minuscule problem. Uh, the, the, the amount of times ants are gonna bring mold, it's not even worth discussing about in this. It's worth talking about with the ant problem. It's not really worth talking about with the mold problem. Uh, and the problem with mold is that it can be dangerous to birds, but at the very least, they're not gonna eat it. If they do, it can be damaging. It can be uh, harmful or fatal. But at the end of the day, they're, they're not gonna, we're not gonna eat moldy food. Why should we expect them to eat moldy food? So birds are gonna stay away from it. Uh, it attracts insects, it attracts rodents. Uh, a lot of times, uh, mice and squirrels, it's not gonna hurt them. That's literally what they do. Uh, the corvidae, it's not gonna bother them. They'll, they'll figure it out. So uh, you, you wanna keep away from that. When it gets dirty, so now you tube feed it, yeah, you know what? Every once in a while, the birds have eaten it. Maybe there's a bit of seed left. You dump it in the compost, hose it down, fill it up, hang it back up. But now if you've got mold and fungus in all of these holes, well, now you might have to start going through with a kit like this and scrubbing it out and cleaning it out. Okay, great. You want it to be clean. The birds want it to be clean, but it's very, very time consuming. So you want to keep it as clean as possible uh, from the get-go. You can also get cross, I'm going to stand up. Okay, there we go. You can also get cross-contamination. You bring mold and fungus into one area of your garden, there's a good chance those spores carry either through the birds. The birds go to the cedar, much like the pollen, they get those fungal spores on them, then they disappear into your cotoneaster hedge. They can bring problems with them. So having that cross-contamination isn't great. Best way to avoid it is don't overfill your feeders. I understand people get ambitious. They've never fed the bird. So you're like, ah, I have squirrels. I'm gonna get one of these. This will beat everything. Uh, it won't attract wasps or ants. And they fill it to the brim, okay, uh, with seed. And then they hang it. Well, you've never fed any birds. The birds don't know it's there. So they eat a quarter of it. Well, it gets rained on. You've got tightly packed seed with very minimal airflow. Now it's filled with moisture, organic material. Then the sun comes out and warms it up. You've got a breeding ground, breeding ground for mold and fungus to grow. So you may find you need to fill your feeder and you might only go up to here. You might only go up to there. It's gone in two hours. Great, fill it up to there. Gone in four hours, fill it up to there. It took a day, fantastic. Now you know what your level is at. So you want to keep an eye on it. Don't overfill thinking you'll attract more birds because it can end up attracting other things, especially the mold that you don't want. And then keep your seed when you're storing it. Keep it in a cool, dry location. I love this one. It comes in a bucket, okay? So this is a great storage thing. It's gonna stop moisture from getting in and rotate your seed. You buy one of these, and, and of course I don't have two the same, but say you buy this, and then you wanna try this one. Use all of this one first. The more you leave that, the more it's got the likelihood of being open, attracting bugs, moisture got in one day when it was open, whatever might happen, and away you go. So. Try and rotate, always use your newest uh, stock first. And then, uh, and I didn't create a slide for this, so I apologize. Um, you get that inherent problem of the birds themselves. You bring birds into your garden, uh, and one of the most heartbreaking things uh, is hearing a bird smack a window. Um, 99 times out of 100, it's gonna do no damage to your window or your home. Uh, but 99 times out of 100, it is going to do damage to the bird. That one time out of 100, it's going to do damage to both. Uh, it may not kill the bird, it may stun it, but now it's leaving it open to attack from other birds, uh, from cats. So it's very bad news. A lot of times it kills the bird, breaks their neck, they're done. Stick some decals on, okay? If you hear it once or twice, a few decals, get some uh, Crayola washable markers. Let the kids have fun. 
draw flowers, draw birds, draw whatever you want, but let the birds know that it's there. And then you might want to put up a bird net. If you're growing your own veggies, your own fruits, they're going to pick it off. They can't help themselves. I get it. So you may need a little bit of protection in your own garden for the problems the birds bring themselves. And then I just want to wrap up by saying birding is not an exact science. You can follow every step I've given, absolutely everything, and still not get the birds you want. Don't give up, okay? Patience is essential. You're dealing with a wild animal. You're dealing with something that is, a lot of times we ask, uh, what is this good for? Nothing, nothing. It, it doesn't have to have a purpose to us. It doesn't have to justify its existence to human ego in order to exist. It just exists. We want to bring them in because we enjoy them. So you can't say, well, my neighbors had this bird. Why is it not coming to my yard? Maybe I like that yard better. It's more established there, whatever the case might be. But if you see, you, you put out this, uh, and in a, in a week you get black cap chickadees. Celebrate that. Remember what food you used. Put more in. Don't go, oh my God, it worked, and hang five more of these and confuse them. Don't move the feeder closer to the house. Leave it there. Let it establish. Celebrate your successes. Build on that. Don't beat yourself up over failures. If I beat myself up over every failure I've had with a plant, I wouldn't be where I am. I've learned from them all. I have uh, overwatered. I have overfertilized. Sometimes by accident, sometimes through ignorance. I didn't know any better. Uh, I have pruned incorrectly. I have done so many wrong things, but that brought me to this place now where I can share the knowledge to make other people successful. So don't beat yourself up uh, over a, a small failure, a small setback. Go, okay, I hung up my hummingbird feeder. I got covered in wasps. What can I do? Reach out to us. We're going to help you get there. And, and honestly, the vast majority, the reason birding is such big business, the reason it's so insanely popular is because it will be successful. If you build it, they will come. And the best time to start is the winter. Food is scarce. The birds are looking for anything. Everything is white and gray and everything else. You hang this and fill it with seed, it's going to stand out. And the birds are going to be like, oh my God, food, they're going to come. Well, if they know where that is in the spring, they can find their way back. So that's what you want to do. You want to build the garden around it. If you look at that picture on the slide, that's an ideal garden. You got a feeder close enough to shelter. The birds can come and go, but it's not in the middle of a bed. It's not on the lawn. So any spilled seed isn't going to cause a weed problem. There's a bird bath again close to shelter but right not right next to the feeder so the birds can go from their shelter to the bath to the feeder to the bath to their shelter however they want to work it's shady it's cool everything a bird is looking for so real broad strokes like i said i can't go into too much detail i don't have the time uh there's so many it's such an integral part when you're dealing with something like this but I want to say a massive thank you to you guys for tuning in. I love my wild animals. I love supporting them. I love encouraging them. And I, I, as you know, in all things, in people, in gardens, in wild animal, I love diversity. We need diversity. Everybody and everything is welcome in my garden. So uh, I hope you guys feel the same. Uh, I'll wrap that up and we'll have some Q&A.